I was always taught, my father was a politician, and he taught me when making a speech, you tell an audience what you're going to say, you say it, and you tell them what you've just told them. <laughs> so I think that's a good uh, structural thing. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. The first thing I want to do is really paint for you an impressionistic picture of the changes that, are, that there have been in English education in the last 30 years, and particularly in the last five years. And I think from having talked to people earlier this evening, you will find this relevant if you're at a point of looking at your own public education system and thinking about what kind of reforms might make it better. And really, if you want the short um, summary of my lecture is please don't look at England, because England is not a model, I think, for where you want to go. But perhaps we can discuss that. So I want to locate what's happened in England in both a national and a global context, because I think probably, although we're looking, England in this lecture, we're looking towards Europe, the truth is that we, we have more in common what's been happening in America. And really, I think what's been happening in America is in many ways quite shocking. Um, I don't know if any of you follow the work of Diane Ravitch, but if you don't, some of you are nodding, please do. She's, she's a wonderful writer, and I think it's very interesting that she started out as an advisor to George Bush the first. Do you remember the thinner one, the slightly taller, thinner, more intelligent one, I suspect? Um, and then she turned against, um, it's funny also, you'll all laugh two minutes after my jokes because of the um, translation. Um, <laughs> but she has, she has become a, a, a voice of conservation for good public quality education. And if I could in any way think of myself as contributing to that same debate in England and that same outcome, I would be very, very pleased. So I will be talking about what's happened in England, not the United Kingdom, because Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have, have, have different systems. And I've visited Scotland, I'm married to a Glaswegian, um, I've debated with the Scottish minister, I think they're doing many good things. They have, as all education systems around the world have, problems that relate to the quality and inequality in their own societies. But they have not gone down the route of marketisation. Wales has equally not done that, but has been the... Um, I don't know if this will translate easily, the whipping boy of the political right in England, because Wales has stuck by a fairly a straightforward, comprehensive system, and every time their results come out, uh, particular journalists who have an interest in attacking comprehensives or state education, um, they, they attack Wales. I think actually Wales is doing rather well now. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about them, but I just have. But the second thing I want to do is, is I want to challenge the narrative that is propagated by our government. Um, at the moment, we have a Conservative government. They won a narrow majority in May, but they were in effect in power for five years from May 2010. And that was really when the revolution in our school system went on speed dial, if that makes sense in translation. It intensified. Um, I think that it's led to a worrying picture of fragmentation um, of our system, of unhealthy competition, and a narrowed conception of learning and a widespread demoralization among the professionals in our system, which means that this is a story that I think will eventually end badly. So. Although I am going to talk about what's gone wrong, because I think it might be helpful to you, I also want to offer some hope, too. Um, I think the inherent weaknesses of our system, as I say, will lead, you know, what was the Marx, Marxist phrase, inherent contradictions, it will collapse. Um, but at the same time, a lot of very hard work has been done over the years by those who have a different picture of how public education could look. A lot of head teachers have been working independently. There was an article, I read it on the, on the plane over here, an article in The Guardian 
about a group of head teachers who are trying to come up with ways of improving our system different from the government ways. Our trade unions are quite active, and although they are under huge attack from the political right and the political centre, I think the trade unions have responded quite well in not only defending the interests of their members against um, the breakup of national pay and conditions and changes in the schooling system, but also in coming up with ideas for reform. And of course, in our country, there has been a huge political change in the last, where are we, October the 6th, in the last six weeks, with the election of Jeremy Corbyn as the leader of the Labour Party. And I presume you've all followed that. Um, now, who knows where that's going to go? Who knows what's going to happen to the Labour Party? I'm a, I've been a member of the Labour Party for longer than I should. My daughters, who are very radical, have just joined the Labour Party because of Jeremy Corbyn. For years, they told me that the Labour Party was a centrist, consensus-seeking, stale party, and they were right in a way. But now, hundreds and thousands of young people have joined. And Jeremy Corbyn is very interested in education. And one of the things that he wants to do is set up a, national, a commission to look at a national education service in para, um, similar to our National Health Service. And our National Health Service is considered one of the great public institutions in our country, but also, I think, internationally. So I'm going to try and help Jeremy Corbyn in, in looking at what a National Education Service might look like. And I'm going to share some of those ideas with you tonight. So three things. Where have we gone wrong? Um, well, two things, really. Where have we gone wrong and how might we think about public education in a different way? Now, I, the way I think of what's happened in my country is that over the last five years, there's been a really tremendous and in some ways impressive but frightening kind of energy. And a very strange alliance has emerged and, and has taken over when I say public education, I mean state education. So I shall use the term state education. And that alliance is um, an unholy alliance, if that term makes sense, between top-down, centralising government of the centre-right and a whole range of third sector, voluntary and increasingly private interests. And I call them many things. I write about them. I do try not to be too rude because, you know, courtesy is important in political debate. Um, but they are, the, I call them the new educational evangelists because they have a sort of evangelistic energy. They really, I think we have to credit them with sincerity. They believe that they have they've taken over a ailing and rotten public uh, state education system and they are transforming it. Um, they're also called the New School Revolutionaries and I'm going to refer to the changes that they have made as the New School Revolution because I think that is a perfectly accurate term. Now, if we, there are two origins of this New School Revolution. One is national and one is global. And the national one is really in what you might call the rise of neoliberalism, economic neoliberalism over the last 30 years. So that began with Margaret Thatcher, not Margaret Thatcher herself, but Thatcherism. We love isms in England. We have isms all over the place. Thatcherism, which was then succeeded by Blairism. And of course, Blairism was a very interesting ism in many ways, but um, at one of the reasons that Tony Blair won in 1997, his, his, one of his key slogans was education, education, education. And the thing about Thatcherism was that it, was, it had a rather what now looks like an old-fashioned view about state education. It, she was obviously of the Tory party, leading the Tory party. Historically, the Tory party have not been that interested in state education. Most of them are educated themselves in what we call our private schools, which are elite institutions that educate the most affluent 7%. And there's an interesting story about how during the Second World War, before we had universal secondary education, when there was evacuation during the war, a million children were not in school. And when people said to the Tory government, the leaders of the Tory government at the time, well, why didn't you realise this? What was clear was that the 
the Tory leaders had no idea what went on in state education because they lived in a particular bubble. So I think Thatcherism, Thatcherism drew on that tradition. It wasn't very interested in state education. It looked down on it. It demonised it. It didn't resource it. And th a lot of buildings were falling down during the 70s and 80s. Um, and Tony Blair came along and said, we need to inject resources and hope into our state education system. And I remember voting for Tony Blair. I did vote for Tony Blair. Um, and it was a mar an incredible feeling. And a lot of that was about what he was going to do in education. And it did start well. It started very well. He cut class sizes to 30. He spoke in a positive way about teachers in our state system, which was something very new. And he introduced various strategies, which in the end became satirised because they were just a series of directives from Number 10 Downing Street, which is where the Prime Minister, you know where Number 10 Downing Street is. But uh, they were, you know, his aim was to improve state education. But I think the neoliberal part of Blairism became more obvious. And it became more obvious in education with the beginning of what was called the Academy Programme. And the Academy Programme was an attempt to improve our inner city state schools in areas where there was tremendous sort of poverty and conflict and tension. But what Tony Blair did, and excuse my slight cartoon approach, I'm just trying to explain it, was he didn't believe that the public sector could reform itself. He didn't believe state education could reform itself. So he called in the private sector. So it became, at the beginning, people treated it rather like a joke. He was asking people who ran carpet warehouses. He was asking people who um, ran mobile phone companies. And he was saying to them, bring your entrepreneurial energy to our schools and make them work. And there was a lot of protest about it, but it did create some quite impressive schools in a way, because also there were new buildings and... There had been a problem, and I think we have to be honest when we talk about our education system at any point about what the problems are. And there had been problems with discipline. There had been problems with poor results. And Blair, Blairism, let's not make it individual, Blairism put this tremendous energy merged with these private companies into certain schools, and they became model schools for a while when Arne Duncan, who is an American reformer, flew into London, he was immediately taken over to Hackney in East London to see this marvellous school. And um, Blairism was very proud of that. But the trouble with Blairism and the trouble with um, the consensus that he built on was not that he wanted to improve state schools, but that he wanted to improve state schools by rejecting the expertise, the experience, and the knowledge of everyone who worked in state education. So if you are discussing how to improve your state schools, I would say to anyone who is leading or shaping that discussion, draw on the expertise of the people who know. Talk to the trade unions, talk to the municipal authorities, talk to the teachers, talk to the head teachers. That wasn't what happened in our country. Uh, there was a view that the Tories who came into power in 2010, as I say, have just moved ahead with, a view that local authorities were terrible. They, they seemed to have two problems. They over-controlled schools, according to the government, and they didn't control them enough. You know, some people just can't win. Um, trade unions were a problem, and the political right particularly have a problem with trade unions. They thought that the teacher trade unions were guilty of what they call provider capture rather than consumer awareness. Because, of course, parents were being recast as consumers rather than part of a neighbourhood or a, a collective project. They even, when the Conservatives came in, we're now jumping ahead to 2010, they completely decimated the teacher training system that we had because they thought that universities were full of left-wing 
um, Marxists, well, left Marxists are left-wing, but uh, left-wing progressive, child-centred educators who just didn't have craft and discipline to create good education. And there, there was an also a huge criticism of progressive education itself. Um, so, there, yeah, and, and the other thing to say, and it is quite complicated, is that in 1960s and 70s, we had comprehensive reform. We had had a system that divided children up at 11, going to grammars or secondary moderns. There was a tremendous movement against that, and the majority of our country became comprehensive. Now, that's been the most politically contested reform, I would say, of post-war England. There is, within our society, and particularly among our elite, who run politics and who run the media and broadcasters, a belief that our children can't go to school together. You know, they, they and also a fear, particularly with growing religious and ethnic tensions, a fear about unified schooling. So all of those things fed into the neoliberal consensus in our country and created the new school revolution. Um, but just before I talk a bit more about that new school revolution, I would just say, you know, that th if the original aim was to improve public systems, I think if I s look at my side of the school wars, and school wars is just a, a term, I think those of us who believed in good neighbourhood schools, those of us who believed in comprehensive education, non-selective schools, those of us who thought teachers were on the whole doing a good job, we, didn't, we weren't smart enough, we weren't quick enough to come up with our own plans for improvement. And that opened a space up for a mix of you know, powerful political, powerful government and um, new economic interests to come in and transform our system. Um, I think the most worrying part of the new school's narrative in our country is its own certainty that it is progressive and egalitarian. Because what it, what it argues, not so much anymore because there isn't that much evidence, it argues that traditionally state education let the poor down, it didn't give them enough knowledge, there's a tremendous debate in our country about a knowledge curriculum. I don't know if you've heard of the work of E.D. Hirsch, but E.D. Hirsch is an American thinker who says that there should be a common core of knowledge that all children draw on. And I think that's an interesting idea because I think it could be used for progressive or non-progressive ends. But again, this is an idea that the right, political right, have run, taken and had some success with. And what they said was that our schools were knowledge weak and skills heavy and that children were being taught how to work in projects or how to talk to each other. They weren't being taught about all the rivers of the world, all the capitals of the world. They, weren't, they couldn't do their times tables and so on. Personally, and I think that the debate has now landed at this point, all schooling is a mix of knowledge and skills. I mean, I'm not a, I haven't taught in secondary education, but I've taught in high, you know, adult education. I just don't see why it has to be one or the other. But that's been a very important feature of our, of our schooling. Um, so the, uh, the, the idea behind the New School Revolution was that they would transform our schools and they would get children out of poverty through education. That, that poorer children would have access to a knowledge-rich curriculum, they would get good exam results, they would go on to higher education, and um, they would then go into an economy, which, as we all know, there aren't that many jobs, even for people who are graduates. So there's a lot of things that didn't quite add up. Um, the final key part of our new school's revolution is privatisation. Uh, it's the most worrying part of the jigsaw. And um, it began, as I said, with the introduction of of private companies and also third yeah. sector and voluntary groups and increasingly religious groups. And um, it accelerated, oh, have I, sorry, I've just lost my place. No, yeah. So it accelerated with um, the academy program and so on. And now privatization is a real feature of our schools. 
you can't make a profit in English schools, but there is an enormous amount of money circulating around. Half of our schools have been taken out of municipal, local authority control and are now being run either by religious organisations or by private companies. A lot of private companies don't make money directly from schooling, but they sell the school's services. A lot of people who run schools are earning more than the Prime Minister. I mean, actually, our Prime Minister doesn't earn that much in terms of private sector money, but there's a lot of money now in schools which, which there wasn't. And, there's a trim and the idea is that schools will compete and they will compete on their results and parents will choose on the basis of results, um, which I think is a very, very bad idea. Now, what's the vision? What's the actual vision behind this? What's the educational vision behind it? Um, in preparation for this lecture, I read UNESCO's report that Val sent me. And it's very, very interesting to read. It's like entering a completely different world. It talks about the need for citizenship education. It talks about the need for children to understand what's happening in the environment. It talks about the need for uh, tolerance and understanding of others. That completely contrasts with the vision that underpins the English system. Because if you have a highly competitive, individualised system where schools are competing and teachers are competing within schools to get better results, how can the vision of your system be anything other than highly individualistic? Um, so the idea is just, it, it's now very much shaped around moving up the rungs, getting good results, and going on to higher education. Um, and the attention, it's about all going to, about going to universities, but of course our university system is now very, very hierarchical and stratified. You, you can pay up to 50 or 50, 60,000 pounds to get a university education. If you go to a university like Oxford or Cambridge or one of the selective elite universities, you'll come out and you'll have a good chance of getting a job. But poorer children who tend to go to the lower ranked universities are still paying 50 or 60,000 pounds and then they're coming out into a, a, a market where there's a glut of graduates. So it's, it, it's perpetuating inequality rather than undermining it. And just talking about ranking, to give you an idea of how the system has developed, in some schools, in academy and free schools, which are part of the new schools that have emerged, they, in, in the hallway, they will rank children. They will have a list of the children and who is the best and going down to who's doing the least well. I'm not quite sure how that relates to children changing, you know, scores change and so on. But there was even a discussion um, and a proposal by, I think it was Michael Gove, who was our education secretary, a very interesting character, that there should be national rankings and that you should publish a list of, I don't know how many, thou hundreds of thousands of school children, and you would know that Susan Brown was at the top and that some poor unfortunate child was at the bottom. I mean, what a terrible idea is that? If you think of education as being about, in my view, imagination, encouragement, hope, uh, learning how to fail successfully, if that makes sense, how can telling children from the age of 8 or 9 or 14, you're the best, you're the worst, how can that be a good idea? So, um, terrible idea. Now, I just, I've talked about the national context bit. I just want to talk briefly about the global context before I come on to um, what, what I would like to see change. The global context really can be summed up by the acronym GERM, the Global Education Reform Movement. Now, in England, GERM is something nasty. When you feel unwell, you have a GERM. Germs circulate around your body. So in our case, we like, you know, those of us who oppose it think GERM is a very good term. But GERM is actually a powerful global movement that is bringing all these elements into education that I've talked about. So Passy Salberg, who is a Finnish educator, 
has talked about f the five key elements of the global education reform movement, and I think they are um, worth just mentioning. The first is standardization of education, centrally prescribed curricula with detailed and often ambitious performance tar targets, frequent testing of students, and test-based accountability. The second feature is focus on core subjects in school, in other words, on English, maths and science. Basic student knowledge and skills in reading, writing and mathematics are elevated as prime targets and whole nation systems are now judged by how well they do in international tests such as PISA, TIMS, and PEARLS. The third characteristic is the search for low-risk ways to reach learning goals. That minimizes experimentation, reduces use of alternative pedagogical approaches, and limits risk-taking in school and classrooms. The fourth globally observable trend is use of corporate management models. Education policies and ideas are lent and borrowed from the business world. This limits the role of national policy development and enhancement of an education system's own capability to maintain renewal. It also paralyzes teachers' and schools' attempts to learn from the past. And the fifth global trend is adoption of test-based accountability policies. School performance, especially raising student achievement, is closely tied to processes of accrediting, inspecting, and ultimately rewarding or punishing schools and teachers. Success or failure of schools is often determined by standardised tests and public exam results. And that is certainly what is happening in America, where things have, um, have gone way ahead of where we've, we are in England. And I think it's really, really very frightening. And it's also completely narrowing what children are learning, so that you have in some places virtual schooling, where children are just sitting in front of computers, learning how to master tests. I mean, that is so far from an idea of education as a public good or a social experience. But uh, all of these things have come to England, and I won't go into it too much, but we have seen um, the narrowing of what children are encouraged to learn. Schools are judged on whether their students at 16 have done five academic subjects, English, math, science, and a humanity. Now, that's fine. Nobody is against that. I don't think a school should be judged on it because, of course, it depends on what students they're taking in. But what has meant that a lot of our art-based subjects have dropped away. So I think there's been a I mean, 20 30% drop in art and drama and music and all the things that make life fun and meaningful and therefore make schools fun and meaningful. Our curriculum has been rewritten. There was a huge argument. Michael, I mean, once upon a time, teachers and education professionals wrote curricula. In England, the politicians write curricula. And Michael Gove, this interesting man who thought he knew everything and was very articulate about it, decided to rewrite the history curriculum to take away a lot of elements of world history, to return it to a quite traditional view of our island's history. Um, a professor at Oxford said that it had just become a kind of pub quiz, that it was a really uh, sort of lean and mean curriculum, but that's what we have. Uh, it's now prescribed how you teach reading through the phonics system, which those of you in primary education will know about, and teachers no longer have the capability to decide the best way to teach reading. And teacher training, I think it's one of the most depressing things, has um, been abandoned, well not abandoned, has been shifted largely to the classroom. So I have a 21-year-old daughter. Some of her peers and friends are now going into teaching through, um, in America you have something called uh, Teach for America. In England you have Teach First. And these are organizations that encourage students from elite universities to go into teaching or to give it a try for the first few years. And... I have a problem with that, partly because I think teaching is a public service and I think people should enter it with a sense of wishing to stay. But there you are, you want to have good teachers. But they have training of six weeks in the summer and then they go into a classroom. And I think this development is taking our system away from the way it should have developed and the way it should have improved. I think we should have had longer teacher training. And I'll, I'll come back to that. 
So to come to the question that I've been asked to answer, um, I could have said so much more about our system, but you'll be grateful that I've said what I've said. Uh, is public education at risk? And I think this is a very interesting question with an interesting answer. You know, at one level, even I would say no. When I say public education, I mean state education. I would say no in this sense. Education still remains free at the point of use, and that is very, very important, at least up to secondary level. I think university fees are a huge problem. However, I wonder for how long we will have free education. Already you have cases of schools that charge parents this and that for things, and there was an interesting case where the school that the Prime Minister and the Education Secretary sent their daughter, which is a highly um, successful London State School, rather selective but successful. Every parent that got a place was asked to write a cheque for £100. So you can see the creeping beginning of charges coming in. And we have the same discussion in uh, the health service. Should people who don't go to their doctor, who miss an appointment, pay and so on? And I think once you, once you cut out the idea that this is free for all, you're going down a dangerous road. The second reason why we can say public state education is not at risk, because it is still, dis we, government does still decide the direction of education. Our local education authorities have been uh, cut away, but government is still, um, is still deciding. So that's a good thing. Um, I think the third reason, interestingly, why we could be optimistic, and I'm trying to be balanced here, is because, to go back to my argument about a section of the Tory party, a section of the Conservative part of England, wasn't that interested in state education. Now there's a sense that it is a national project. It's a national project, but it's one that's been taken over by the new educational evangelists. So the jury is out there on on that element of it. But that point about the Prime Minister sending his daughter to a state school, that is, that's a new thing. You know, for a long time, conservative politicians sent their children to the 7% of schools. So um, the other thing I want to say is that although there are all these negative changes, schools are human institutions and there are still wonderful, hundreds of wonderful state schools and wonderful teachers and so on, and everybody's doing their best. And my children went to a local comprehensive. They absolutely loved it. They did well. They've come out, obviously I think this because I'm their mother, but they've come out really good, rounded citizens. <laughs> um, of course, family background is such a big part of how children, um, how children do. So I'm going to end now by talking about what alternatives, what are the different ways of thinking about state education? And this is really to get a debate going with you. And also because a lot of us now are feeling that the new school revolution is running out of steam. We've got problems with teacher recruitment. There's a huge problem of overload. Teachers are working too hard. When the new education secretary asked teachers to tell her if they were feeling overloaded, 40,000 teachers replied to her email. I don't think she's actually done anything about it, but anyway, she asked them. Um, we have, there's problems of recruiting teachers in core subjects and so on. There's more and more scandals about financial mismanagement and corruption within schools. There's a lot of schools that were offered autonomy under the new system who are now struggling to survive. Um, and a lot of the academy chains, which we were told were going to make schools really efficient and good, are not doing very well. And actually, when you look at the results of the academies and free schools, these new schools that the government have promoted, they are not doing any better in their own terms than the schools connected to the local authorities, the other kind of state schools. So how do we fight back? What's, what's a new way of thinking about education. I do think the inherent weakness in the current system will catch up with them, but we have to have a richer and more positive vision to offer. So five key ideas for the future. You can tell I'm a politician's daughter. They always like to five. Um, firstly, I would like to see both nationally and across Europe and 
across the globe, a different quality of conversation about our schools, because I think for the last 10 years it has all been about uh, data and accountability. Uh, but one thing I'd like to see is to start with a simple and humble and human recognition there is a limit to what schools can do. Schools cannot solve inequality, and it is not fair to ask teachers to do so. People talk about Finland, which is a successful European system, although I think even that has slipped down the rankings, if you trust the rankings. But Finland's school system enjoyed what you call a virtuous circle. It started with lower levels of inequality, and its comprehensive school system has kept that equality going. If you look at England, we are a deeply unequal society. We always have been. You can't understand English society if you don't understand the class system. People say the class system has ended. That's nonsense. I'm here to tell you the class system is alive and well. It's just mixed up with a kind of consumerist American sheen, but it's still there. Um, and for the new school revolutionaries to say to teachers and schools, the old state education system promoted inequality. It's up to you now to close that gap. It's an impossible pressure. So I think we have to accept the limitation of what schools can do. Secondly, and be more honest about it, secondly, I think we need to have, we need to debate a different conception of education itself. And this may in some ways be going back to earlier ideas, but revisiting them with the experience that we have. And the, you know, it, everything is a dialectic. <laughs> and we've learned a lot from the change of the last five years. Some we may be able to retain, some we may be able to not get rid of. But the idea of education being just a, an, a series of outcomes rather than an experience, rather than a quali um, ra thinking about quantity instead of quality, I think we need to start thinking again about quality. And I don't think that's very complicated. It's an abstract term but it means restoring a broad and balanced and arts-rich curriculum. That's such an important part of education. And mixing that with some common curriculum in the more academic subjects. One of the more interesting ideas to come not out of the government, but out of head teachers who've been gathering is, is a baccalaureate idea. The idea that every um, school should offer a mix that that pupils should put together more of a program of learning. So that in the early years uh, of secondary education, 11 to 14, uh, pupils learn similar subjects, but then somebody who might want to go on to do a vocational subject might start to learn about plumbing or hairdressing, but continue to do philosophy as well. People would do... Um, voluntary service out in the community, there would be more individual projects. And in terms of a question that a very interesting and nice young journalist asked me earlier, it could provide a new form of accountability for our schools. Instead of looking at everything in terms of results, schools would have to say that this child has done 20 hours of community service, this child has written an essay on something that they really, really are passionate about, as well as doing exams and vocational qualifications and so on. So there is an imaginative way of looking at a high quality, rigorous school system that is more individual. Um, the other thing is that we, in, uh, in state schools in England, we're always being told we should learn from the elite private schools. We're told that the thing that's good about elite private schools is that they are independently run, they're not controlled by government, they, don't, they have unqualified teachers, which is another feature of our system. We now have un, unqualified teachers, which I think is a very bad idea. I think we could learn from our elite private schools in a different way. They show us the importance of small classes. They show us the important, importance of individual attention. If there has been a criticism of state education, and a fair one, it's that teachers haven't got the time and the energy to give individual attention to pupils. We need to bring that into the state system. And to do that, we have to have resources. Private schools have lovely buildings. Some of them have buildings that are like hotels I could never afford to stay in. 
Uh, for my book, School Wars, I went to visit a famous public school, which is an elite private school. I lost count of the things that they had. 16 football pitches, two, their own drama studio. They were connected to Saatchi and Saatchi, the art dealers, on a website. They had two concert halls. It was just a picture of luxury. And it was so interesting. They also teach their um, students emotional literacy, in which one of the things the students have to learn is to defer gratification. And you look at what they've got and you think, they don't need to defer gratification. Their whole life is about being gratified. Anyway, these schools cost 35,000 a year and very few people can afford it. I think money matters in the state sector. We're told it's not about money, it's about the kind of teaching. Money does matter. So all these things we need to think closely about. We, we also need to think about the importance of oracy as well as literacy. Learning to speak early on, learning to debate, learning to talk is a very important part of reinforcing intelligence and ideas and so on. The government has cut back the element of talk in our classrooms. They think it's idle chatter, children wasting time. But I know from my own experience, if I come and I talk to you, I learn more and my, my learning becomes deeper. I think we should be doing that throughout our state system. Um, thirdly, I th we need to return, but with new knowledge, to the idea of the good neighbourhood school. In, um, as a friend of mine who's campaigning in, against what's happening in America, he wrote to me very late last night, this is the trouble with email, you end up having conversations at two in the morning when you should be in bed getting ready to get your plane to Barcelona. And he said, schools are about developing the next generation, introducing the individual to the other, supporting strong communities and maintaining democratic values. In England, that's not the case. We, there, we believe education is best if you pay for it, or you travel to access it, or you compete to win it, or you defeat someone else in order to access it. What about returning to the idea of less choice and more of a rich educational experience locally as a human right? The kind of ideas that Diane Ravitch has put forward and that have seemed to work in Finland. And part of that means a highly trained, specialised and skilled teachers because that's another form of intelligent accountability. Instead of looking just at numbers, what about saying we really trust our teachers and we trust that they will give our children a good educational experience? We have traveled the other way, as I've said. We have unqualified teachers. We give our young people six weeks training. So of course we don't trust them. We look at the numbers. But let's not look at the numbers. Let's look at the human beings. Fourthly, I don't know we're going to be able to take back the tide of privatisation in England, but I think we need to bring schools into some form of democratic control. Um, you can't have schools, and, and certainly stop the for-profit tide that will happen if the Conservatives carry on. We've also cut back our adults on our further education, and our system is now a one-chance system. If you don't get your exams at 16 or 18, it's very hard to access education after that. To me, education is about lifelong learning. I came out of university realising how little I knew, and that began 30 years of learning. And I was what you would consider, you know, I succeeded in the school system. It is crazy to say that education is finished at 16 or 18. We have to have institutions and practices in place so that people can enter education at any point in their life. I think university is wasted on young people. I really do. I wish I could now go back to university at the age of 58, but I can't afford it. So, um, so that I think those are my five ideas. They may have gone on to six or seven. We've got a big battle on our hands in England trying to get these ideas back back into the public sphere. And one way we're going to do that, and it may be helpful when you're thinking about what you, reforms you want, is to come up with really sensible, well-tested, practical reforms that take forward our values. So maybe it's about talking less about the values, education as a pu public good, important as that is, and talking about the ways we're going to implement it. As I said, Jeremy Corbyn wants to set up a commission to look at a national education service, and I hope that he will not only 
look at the funding questions and the importance of free education, but we'll look at some of these really imaginative ideas that can take our system back to one that works for everyone and makes school an enjoyable and rich experience, which is what it should be. Partly I'm going to repeat myself in saying teachers are not trusted at all. There is no respect for teacher agency, I think, within the government. I think that's perfectly clear. What I do see are um, people on the ground coming up with ideas of how self-improving systems or teacher agency. There's a group called Research Ed, which is a group of teachers who've got together and meet to share ideas about education, you know, the, a new emphasis on what educational research can tell teachers in the classroom. There's another group called Northern Rocks, which is teachers in the north of England. I spoke at their conference last June. Incredible sort of vibrancy and excitement about doing things on the ground. Things like the Heads Round Table, which is heads who've come up with this baccalaureate formula. And of course, the trade unions like the ATL, Mary Boosted, who's a terrific person. And I mean, all the trade unions, as I said at the beginning, are all sort of trying to come up with practical ideas, but partly because they've just been frozen out of the system. So how all those things might be incorporated by a government that was more respectful is, is an interesting question. I mean, there used to be, didn't there, um, was it the National Teacher Council? There used to be professional bodies that would look at research and would disseminate that to professionals. But those have all been swept away in the bonfire of the quangos. And so, it, as I say, it's all just bottom up at the moment. But it doesn't mean there aren't lots of exciting ideas around. And, and also, um, there are sort of groups of schools that collaborate and share ideas. And there's all sorts of things happening in the system. It's just rather atomized. And it's, it's unless you're like me or you and know what's going on, and I, I know a bit, it's very easy not to know about exciting things that are going on up the road. Um, I don't know, in a way, I'd quite like to know your answer to that. What would you like to see in the English system? One other point that I would say is in the absence, in, in, with the abolition of bodies that may not have been great but, but served that function of a general teaching council. You've almost had policy making on Twitter. And I mean, I mean that seriously, that a lot of the leading thinkers in an informal way in education are now people with blogs and uh, have huge followings on Twitter. And I think that's a bit odd because you have to spend your life sitting on Twitter to understand what's happening and, you know... No, thanks. As I probably did start from a middle point. I didn't ask the question, what is the purpose? Partly because as you pose it, and you posed it and then set up some of the problems with answering it. Um, my, if I'm allowed to be a utopian for a minute, I think the purpose of public education is to give every child the best chance according to their innate or talents that may be brought out, but they need to be brought out, and not to let background and um, uh, prejudices about where they come from get in the way. Now, that is a huge ask, as we say in England. And you see, you're, I was interested, I don't know about the gypsy school you're talking about, but it has echoes of some of the failures of our state's school, and I've wondered sometimes if it might apply to the Scottish experience, too much about happiness, too much soft learning might deny children the chance to develop interests that need rigorous learning and so on. On the other hand, I stick to my criticism of the new evangelists, and I can explain what I was trying to do more there, is that if it's all about giving children, regardless of their background, knowledge of a certain kind, you know, that can be very, very reductive and put people off. So I th the other thing I should have said is I think it does go back to early years as well. There is a movement in England that says all inequalities begin with early years, access to language, how, you know, you know, you must know the figures. That if you come from a certain background, you've learnt two million words by the time you, you're toddling. Some other backgrounds, you, 
you may, your parents may not talk or you may not be living with your parents and so on. And I've seen that in classrooms. My children went to a local school and I was saying this to someone earlier, there are children arrive age six who know who Gaudi is and there are children who arrive at age six who don't know how to say their own name. So that's not... The, if the purpose of public education is to bring both those children out in an unequal world, that's a huge thing to have to do. But I'm pretty clear what the purpose should be to spot that maybe the child who can't speak their name at six actually has immense talents and latent possibilities. But getting them to, to realise that when they might come from a poor background and state education is relatively under-resourced, is just really difficult. And um, I just think we have to accept that's really, really difficult. But I, but I think the answer is a common curriculum that mixes knowledge, skills, arts and so on and has enough, uh, small enough classes that teachers can, can see everyone as an individual and genuinely work with them. I think what you're saying is that perhaps there wasn't enough, how do we get belief in the, maybe I've been campaigning too long, I now am more pragmatic. I, I think the honest answer is, I've observed this in England, it's exactly the same. Children will say, it, it, it's, it's a little bit more complicated in England in that some state schools are considered good state schools. And, but a lot of children will say, I'm at a bad state school. And my own children, I sent them to the local school because I believe that if local parents supported the local school, we could transform it. And to some degree, we did. Because it's, it's terrible to admit, but in England, and maybe it's the same here, parents look at who else is going to a school. So if you have what you call... Um, uh, what's the phrase, a sort of a, a core of committed parents who care about education and then it kind of raises everybody and they bring a lot to the school and so on. So I do believe passionately in public education. I'll tell you what I do think is I think it creates different kinds of citizens. So in England, traditionally, according to the conservative view, you go to a private school, that's a good school. You go to a state school, it's probably not. I think the, that children who go through the public, the state school system have so much more understanding of the world. I mean, as long as they go and they get their exams and they can go on and do things or they can and be happy as well. There's so many elements. Whereas I think that I don't know about the private schools here, but in England, the private schools are all about separation, segregation, superiority. And it often leads to people who then run our country and bring those values to bear on their political life. So how we do it, I don't know. I, I would like to see, in, in England, we subsidise private schools. They're treated as charities and they get millions of pounds. But actually, how can you be a charity when a parent is able to pay £35,000 a year or £12,000 a year? So... I'd like to see money taken out of that and put into uh, the public schools. But I think it, it's, it's not simple. You have to give resources. You have to put the best teachers into public schools. You have to persuade parents to, to go and support it. You have to constantly be improving it. You, you, I suppose, if I'm honest, you, if a school is inadequate, you can't say it's a wonderful place. You can believe in the values, but the values have to be pragmatically embodied. Um, and the other thing that your, your question reminded me of is the importance of political action. And the way to improve schooling is for the trade unions, for parents, for campaigners, for teachers, for heads to act together. And there is in England quite a strong belief in our state system because in a way the NHS we're proud of and we and I think our school system is something we're proud of our state school system but it's it needs consistent attention and political action we talk down state schools talk down state schools but actually there's a lot of state school success and that needs to be celebrated and shared your your comment interested me very much and reminded me of what I my answer should have been to you which is in Finland 
I heard Passy Salberg come. He came to the House of Commons and he talked about the origin of the Finnish system. And it is really interesting because they had a system very like the English in the 1950s and 60s. A, a, a private elite, selective schools, and then local schools that were no good. They had a long debate and conversation, and in the end they abolished their private schools. They abolished their selective schools, and they introduced a common system to which all children went. And we, we all know what happened then. Two, well, two things happened. They created a very high-quality school system, but also comprehensive education, which in my country, as you noted, is sort of very much a kind of contested thing between the right and the left. Not so much anymore, but it has been. In Finland, that's not the case. Everybody is signed up to the idea of a good local school. And I do wonder sometimes whether you're absolutely right, and you're absolutely right, that the answer is not really a political question, only in the sense of the answers that you want to give. That Everybody agrees that you should have good quality schooling for everyone. That is a 21st century concept. But here's the political question. Can you have it if you do have these elite and separate systems? Perhaps you can only have it if the country collectively agrees on a common system, it is funded and all children go to it. Now, Finland managed it, and when Passi Salberg came and said that at the House of Commons, it was just magical, because the House of Commons is the heart of our democracy, but it's also the heart of our elite. And to say we abolished our private schools in order to create a high-quality European system, oh, it was marvellous. I looked around the room. I wish I could have had a camera looking at the faces of all the politicians. And I stood up and said then, if we did that here, somebody would murder the person who did it. But actually, that's what I passionately believe we would have to do. And I think that would solve your question about the right and the left and solve your, your question. So if only I were Prime Minister, that's what I'd do tomorrow. But maybe Jeremy Corbyn will do it.